Hello everyone. In the previous video, we introduced the notion of open systems via density matrix formalism and the block sphere. In this video, we will continue our discussion on open systems by talking about multipartite systems and the Schmidt decomposition. In the previous video, I gave an example of a system where we had qubit A and qubit B entangled in a Bell state, and we were concerned about the state of qubit A without qubit B. This type of system is referred to as a bipartite system. In particular, a bipartite system is a system with two subsystems A and B with Hilbert spaces H, A, and H, B, such that the Hilbert space for the entire system is defined as H, A, tensor H, B. Of course, you could consider more subsystems than two, in which case you would have a more general multipartite system, but for our purposes, we will just consider two subsystems for now, as the analysis is effectively identical. For these setups, we will usually have the entire system be a pure state, while its constituent subsystems could still be entangled with each other. Previously, I showed how for Bell states, we can obtain the state of one of the qubits by performing a measurement on the other qubit and considering the probability distribution over all possible outputs for the system of interest. We can formalize this notion for subsystems of arbitrary size by defining the partial trace. In particular, we say that if we have a density matrix row AB representing joint system AB, we can get the density matrix for subsystem A, row A, by taking the partial trace over B of row AB. If you've ever taken any courses in probability, you're probably familiar with the notion of joint distributions over multiple variables. You can think of this as computing a marginal distribution from a joint distribution by integrating over all the variables we want to eliminate from our distribution. We're basically doing the same thing here, except we're tracing out the subsystem we don't want instead of integrating. Okay, you may be wondering what the partial trace actually does. Well, all we have to do is take any arbitrary orthonormal basis for B and sum the following expression over this basis. This expression may look a little strange, but let's compare it with our typical trace operation. Here, we sum over all the orthonormal basis vectors with this expected value-like expression. We can make intuitive sense of this definition by thinking of sigma as a matrix in the orthonormal basis we choose, in which case this sum simply has us add up the diagonal elements of the matrix corresponding to sigma, which is the trace by definition. The partial trace is effectively identical to this, except rather than summing over every orthonormal basis vector for the whole system, we only sum over those for the system we want to trace out, and the bras and kets we use to sandwich the operator we are tracing are tensored with identities over the subsystems we want to preserve. Functionally, this is also equivalent to finding the probability distribution over pure states of A, in other words the mixed state, that we would get if we measured B and then toss the measurement outcome. Since this definition is kind of cumbersome, let's try a simple example. Let's go back to the familiar Bell state case. Here, what is the density matrix for A? Pause the video and work through this computation using the partial trace as we defined it previously. Well, as we had stated, row A is simply equal to the partial trace of row AB over B. Since we are working in the standard basis, we will sum over this for the partial trace. Simplifying the result gives us the following, where the first term represents what happens if we measure 0 on qubit b, and the second represents what happens if we measure 1 instead. Now that we have defined bipartite systems, and we now know how to describe their constituent subsystems, let's talk about how we can decompose a pure state in terms of tensor products of states and its constituent subsystems. In general, of course, if system AB is described by some pure state psi, we can write it as an arbitrary sum as follows, where AI and BJ are orthonormal basis vectors for Hilbert spaces HA and HB respectively. However, what we will show is that it is possible to write such a decomposition using a minimal number of terms in the sum whilst still preserving the orthonormality of the bases summed over. We will derive this special decomposition, known as the Schmidt decomposition, and show how to calculate it in the following section. Firstly, how do we derive this decomposition? Well, start with the arbitrary decomposition of psi we mentioned previously. We can rewrite the sum over vectors ai tensored with linear combinations of vectors bj, which we will de define as vectors tilde bi. 
Note that these vectors, tilde bi, are not necessarily orthogonal or normalized. When we compute the state of system A from the state psi, we will of course get the density matrix rho A. Choose the AI vectors to be the diagonal basis of this density matrix, where AI has eigenvalue PI corresponding to a probability value or weight, allowing us to decompose rho A as follows. Let us now take the partial trace of psi over B to recover what rho A should be in terms of the states we have used to define psi. Expanding out the partial trace, we get the following. Note that we can bring the partial trace inside sums just like we can for full traces. Furthermore, if we have a tensor product of two matrices acting on A and B respectively, the partial trace of this expression is simply equivalent to taking the full trace over the subsystem being traced out, and multiplying it by A, of course. This simply follows from the definition of partial trace I gave previously. Using cyclicity of trace, we get the following expression for row A. Here, the inner product of tilde bj and tilde bi corresponds to the matrix element of the ith row and jth column of the density matrix defined in our basis ai. However, since the density matrix is diagonal in this basis, we must have that this inner product equals the eigenvalues along the diagonal when tilde bi and tilde bj are the same, in other words, when i and j are the same, and zero otherwise, which we can write using this Kronecker delta expression. Consequently, this means that the tilde bi basis is orthogonal after all. In order to remove the extra factor of pi in the inner product, in other words, make the basis orthonormal, we rescale each tilde bi by a factor of p to the power of minus one half to obtain these b prime i vectors. Using b prime i, we then have the following decomposition for psi, where the ai vectors are orthonormal and the b prime i vectors are also orthonormal. Any bipartite pure state can be expanded in this fashion, though the choice of basis depends on the pure state, meaning that in general, two pure states cannot simultaneously be expanded in the same basis via Schmidt decomposition. Looking at this decomposition, we can see that it tells us whether a given state is entangled or not. In particular, we can look at the Schmidt rank, which is simply the number of non-zero Schmidt coefficients. If the Schmidt rank is 1, then we have just a product state, meaning that A and B are not entangled. However, if the Schmidt rank is greater than 1, then the state cannot be expressed as a product state, meaning that cis subsystems A and B must be entangled. All that being said, you are probably wondering how we even compute the Schmidt decomposition for a given pure state. Well, to understand this, let's again go back to our generic expansion in the orthonormal bases, which we will specify as A and B. Suppose we want to express our state as the following Schmidt decomposition in terms of the u and v orthonormal bases. We know that there exist unitaries u and v such that u maps ai to ui and v bar maps bi to vi respectively. You might think it weird that we use v bar to map bi to vi rather than just v, but there's actually a good reason for this as we will see later on. Note also that the complex conjugate of any unitary matrix is also unitary even without taking the transpose, so this is a completely fine assumption to make. If we think of u and v bar in the a and b bases respectively, we have that ui, vi in the a and b bases simply correspond to the ith columns of u and v bar respectively. We can write this in Kent notation as follows. Substituting these definitions into the form of the Schmidt decomposition we derived, we can compare the coefficients to those that we started with in which case we get the following equivalence. If we write the coefficients of psi as a matrix where the row is given by the basis vector in A and the column by the basis vector in B, we simply have the following matrix equation, where sigma is a rectangular diagonal matrix with elements given by square root of P sub I. And this is simply, as it turns out, the singular value decomposition of the psi matrix. Consequently, if we take the coefficients of psi and compute the SVD, the U and V bar matrices give us the change of basis required to take us from our original orthonormal bases to the Schmidt bases, and the singular values in sigma tell us the coefficients of the decomposition. Don't worry if you don't know how to do SVD, as I'll explain the process in the following example. As a simple exercise, let's compute the Schmidt decomposition of the state psi equals 
0, 0 plus i, 0, 1, with the appropriate normalization factor of 1 over square root 2, using SVD. Of course, this state is quite easy to find the Schmidt decomposition for by just factoring, but I want you to get practice using the more general SVD method as well. Pause the video and work through the calculation. Here, we have that the psi matrix is given as follows. To compute the SVD, we first compute the singular values. This is simply done by computing the eigenvalues of psi psi dagger and square rooting them. In this case, we have that the singular values are 1 and 0. Consequently, the Schmidt rank is 1, meaning that we have a product state, as we expect. To find the exact basis that factors the state, we simply compute u and v bar. To compute v, we, have, we simply find the eigenvectors corresponding to the eigenvalues of psi dag psi. Note that psi dagger psi and psi psi dagger always have the same non-zero eigenvalues for any matrix psi, meaning that all they differ in is simply the number of zero eigenvalues. Anyways, if we compute the eigenvectors, we get the following values for v and v bar. In order to get u, we could either perform the same process for psi psi dagger, or we could use a trick which states that psi vi is equal to sigma i ui. For sigma 1 equals 1, we have that ui, u1 equals 1 comma 0. And since the other singular value is 0, we simply choose u2 equal to 0 comma 1 as padding just to make u unitary. Since we have Schmidt rank 1, we only consider the first column of u and v. Hence, we have that our state can be written as follows in terms of its Schmidt decomposition. This should be fairly obvious from the fact that you could factor the original from directly without the need for this calculation. However, this shows you how you can compute the Schmidt decomposition if such a trick is not possible. Thus far, we have considered a system AB and talked about how to extract information about system A. However, consider the opposite setup. In particular, suppose you have a system A whose density matrix is a mixed state row A. Is it possible to define an auxiliary system B such that we can define a pure state over AB whose partial trace over B leaves us with row A? Well, as it turns out, the answer is trivially yes. Suppose our density matrix row A has the following ensemble of pure states. Note that here, we are not assuming that these states are orthogonal with each other, though they are normalized, of course. We can simply create a state psi1 over AB of the following form, where each pure state that makes up row A is tensored with some orthonormal basis vector in B, defined as alpha i. This state psi1 AB is referred to as a purification of A, since tracing out B leaves us with the original mixed state for A that we started with. However, note that the realization of row A is not unique. We can always find a different ensemble of pure states that realizes exactly the same density matrix. In this case, we can also construct a separate purification psi 2ab with a different B basis given by beta i kets. So, how are these two purifications related to each other? Well, this is precisely answered by the Schrodinger HJW theorem. The HJW theorem states that given two purifications for two different realizations of the same density matrix row A, there exists a unitary matrix UB such that psi 2AB is equal to IA tensor UB acting on psi 1AB, meaning that psi 1AB can be written as follows. Effectively, this means that we can realize all the ensembles of row A by measuring with respect to different bases for B. For example, here measuring with respect to alpha i gives the p ensemble, while measuring with respect to ub beta i gives the q ensemble for psi 1ab. The proof for this theorem follows trivially from the Schmidt decomposition. In particular, we can write out the Schmidt decomposition as follows for both psi 1 and psi 2, where the ai's are eigenvectors of row a. Note that since both bi1 and bi2 form their own orthonormal bases, we have that there exists a unitary UB that maps between them, trivially proving the HJW theorem. Altogether, we introduced bipartite systems and demonstrated how to extract information about subsystems of the larger state via partial trace, how to expand bipartite states through the Schmidt decomposition, and how to convert density matrices to pure states by introducing auxiliary systems. 
In the next video, we will continue our discussion on open systems by talking about generalized measurement and POVMs. I hope you enjoy this video, and I will see you next time.